Good morning. I welcome you all in the name of Jesus Christ, who is crucified for us all because of God's great love for us. We remember John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I invite you to join me with the words that appear in, in yellow on the screen as we continue in our worship together. It is a dark day to be gathered here, Jesus. It is a barren place, this, filled with shadows and death. But we are here because we need to be here. The shadows of this day are our shadows. The death is our death. Now, as we worship, your cross becomes for us a mirror, reflecting back to us our own brokenness, sinfulness, and darkness. And as we reflect on your love-inspired sacrifice, we discover an open doorway to life. We gather at the foot of your cross because we desperately need to be here. Amen. It seems impossible that anyone would give what you did to save men and women like us. But you gave yourself freely for our sake. It seems unimaginable that anyone could love the way you did, including outcasts, rebels, and even your persecutors, and refusing to strike back. But you loved so much that you laid down your life for our sake. It seems inconceivable that anyone would offer the forgiveness that you did even as nails pierced your flesh and the cross was stained with your blood. But you did not hold our sin against us and took on yourself the suffering that should have been ours. Forgive us that we have allowed greed and violence, pride and deceit, bitterness and coldness to have a place in our hearts. And fill us again with your immeasurable grace, your inexhaustible love, and your unconquerable life that we may be changed and may express our love and devotion through lives of worship. Amen. I invite us to listen to the gospel message of Mark chapter 15, reading from verse 1 to 39, as we hear again the events of this Friday morning, some 2,000 years ago. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again Pilate asked him, are you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. 
knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country. They forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on his staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Let's take a moment in silence to take that in. Lord, we read that it was nine in the morning when they crucified you. And as we sit here, it's 9.30 a.m. We read that at 12 p.m. you had breathed your last. And so this morning as we go about our tasks as we gather to worship here. For these three hours, let us remember your love poured out for us upon the cross. Your blood that was shed so that our sins could be forgiven so that we could know our sins forgiven and so that your power could release us from our bondage to sin. In these moments of worship, as we feel a little disconnected because we're not able to have our usual long service of seven words, because we're not able to sing and pray and spend time as we would normally, we ask that through your Holy Spirit, you would open our hearts and minds to your presence and your love. And fill us with the knowledge that you take upon yourself all the burdens and all the brokenness of the world. And even though it's Friday, we've read this story before. And there's a glimmer of Sunday hope in each of us as we look to your cross. Invite us to stand and sing when I survey the wondrous cross.
love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. And so, loving God, as we stand here, we stand offering our lives to you, acknowledging that you have bought us with the price of your cross. And help us as we listen further to your word read and explained, to hear you speaking into our hearts to be transformed, to become more and more your people. Amen. Let's be seated. Some of the scriptures that explain the uh, crucifixion and resurrection of Christ and what it means that Christ was crucified, they really get complicated. And and I hope I haven't bitten off more than I can chew today. But I thought that I would use Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 23, There's a chance for us to reflect on what Christ has done on this day. As we think of Jesus on the cross, let's hear what Paul has to say. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace with his blood shed on the cross. This is the part that I'll focus on today. Once you were alienated from God, and we're enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard. And that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. May God add his blessing to our reading of his word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, we pray, O Lord. Amen. As Paul writes to the Colossians, he kind of sums up things for them. And maybe verses 21 and 22 is a a short summary. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Once you were alienated, now he has reconciled you. And Paul offers us some more details about what it means to have been alienated and what it means to be reconciled. And I think the first word that, that comes through that confuses me is the word alienated. When we hear the word alienated in our modern language, we say, you're alienating me, you know, like you're, you're pushing me away, like, like you don't want me around, so every time I come into your house, you put on the music I don't like, 
Every time you invite me to supper, you make the hottest curry you've ever made, and you know it blows my head off. All those things that we might say that, that you're alienating me. But I think something is lost of the, of the Greek original in that word alienated. Because it doesn't mean that God has pushed you away. Alienated in this context is like saying you're an alien in a foreign land. You don't belong. You are a stranger in God's presence. You just, you're just a nobody around here. That's what it means to say that you are alienated in this context. Alienated from God. Once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds. Some translations put it enemies in attitude. You didn't belong in the kingdom of God. You, you thought of life in a way that, that didn't suit. It was like you were living in a different nation and you had a a very different set of values and, and beliefs and ideas. You were an enemy in your mind. And these attitudes and thoughts lead to evil action. Paul describes what that kind of evil action looks like in Colossians chapter 3. From verse 5, he describes what these people need to, to get rid of in order to belong. So in chapter 3, he says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self, with its practices. So you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds and you acted out in all of these ways. And Paul seems to center some of his argument about the moral failure of humanity. If you read Romans chapter 1 and you read this in Colossians chapter 3, in the problem of idolatry, the problem of greed, the problem of worshipping the created instead of the creator. And we, uh, on April Fool's Day, we suddenly hear about corrupt politicians resigning and we have to wait till Tuesday or Wednesday to see if that's true. But we can't believe anything we read on April Fool's Day. But we could look up the ladders of life and to the most powerful and say, ah, oh, there they are idolaters and they're so full of evil. But the truth is it's at home in us. We try to find our satisfaction in, in the things of the world, in our own self-esteem. At the moment, mine is in a bicycle, which I've become a little bit too obsessed with riding all the time. Sometimes in, in our cars, sometimes in our relationships, sometimes in our looking for relationships, our looking for somebody to love or somebody to love us, sometimes in the health of our body, all of these things that we look to for our own satisfaction. And all we become is a little bit sort of hungry and desperate. And I know that most of us, when we're hungry, we get hangry. And then all of these other things start to come out. 
you suddenly get angry with people because you're hangry. Suddenly you have a burst of rage that you had never thought of before, and then that malice, which is such a creepy little undertone in, in your conversation, isn't it? I was just thinking as I read of the crucifixion of Jesus, of the malice of the high priests and those people who had put him to death. And you just, I, I don't know, you, your skin crawls at the thought of this powerful group of people gathered somewhere in some palace going, yeah, if only he could just take himself off the cross, eh? He's such a loser. Look at us. You know, that kind of attitude. But we have that malice in that attitude to others. Slander and filthy language. And I always, I know that sometimes, sometimes I get punished for swearing before I swear. So the Lord will know that I'm about to say a bad word and then he hits my toe with the corner of the bed and then I say a bad word. Uh, so I'm, sh I'm sure that's how it works. But we know that all of these, these ugly things, the lies, the malice, the slander, all of that, that stuff comes from a sense of discontent with our lives, with ourselves, with the world that we live in. We are not created nasty people. We are not created thinking of horrible thoughts of other people. We are created with love and by love and for love. We are created for this purity that comes from being in the presence of God, but alienated from the presence of God as he describes it. Enemies in our thoughts and minds, not thinking in a godly way about life. We do evil. It's a symptom of our idolatry. It's a symptom of our being unhappy, of our being consumed with worldly things. And we can imagine a family life or a work life or a friendship life or a community or a church where attitudes like anger and rage manifest more than mercy and love. We can imagine a church where malice and slander rage more strongly than love and grace. And when we think of filthy language, we might think of four-letter and whatever words. But sometimes filthy language is a, is a word of gossip about somebody you don't like. I think that can be filthy language too. The way that we speak and use derogatory terms for people who are different to us you become a toxic kind of community, a toxic family, a toxic workplace, a toxic group of friends, and, and you just become, in a sense, worse and worse. We become tinged with anger, with slander, with malice. And the question is, how do we get rid of this poison? How do we heal our, our scarred and bitter hearts and bodies? How do we embrace a new kind of optimism that comes from knowing that we are loved by God, knowing that we belong to God? We look to the cross. And at the beginning of Colossians chapter 1, Paul writes to them about, about how they are doing good and, and they are famous for their love for all the saints. For he has rescued us from darkness, sorry, I'm just. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This community of Colossi has been transformed. They were slaves, the, the earliest church where the, where the were the, often the weakest of society because they really identified with the humility of Jesus and the way that he triumphed over evil. And I can imagine that being downtrodden and, and, and I mean, if you think that there was labor issues in these days, in those days, you know, whipped and, and all of those things, they could have been so bitter and broken but they were becoming known for their loving kindness. 
They were becoming the people that God created them to be. Colossians 1, 21 and 22, as I'm focusing on, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. And then we remember the good news of verse 22, the solution. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. We were aliens. We didn't belong. We didn't feel like we we had a place in this household of God. Our values were all mixed up and messed up, and that resulted in sin and brokenness. But God did something. And the emphasis in verse 22 is not that You have reconciled yourself to God like you can take some credit for what's been done on the cross today. But He has reconciled you. Reconciled by Christ's physical body through death. And now we are presented holy without blemish and free from accusation. As we try to understand this, we we try to come up with words that describe what what God has done. And one of the words that we use for, for the crucifixion and what Christ is doing on the cross is the word atonement. And I like the way you can easily divide it up. It's at one mint. How God reconciles humanity to himself. And we have lots of strands that make up the rope of our understanding of, of atonement. And if our emphasis is only on one of the strands, we end up with a distorted picture of what God is like. And so the most popular strand of our understanding of how God reconciles humanity to himself is this image in the scriptures of substitutionary atonement. And that's the one we know best and probably love the most. And there's the stories of the, of the judge who was in court and he saw an old school friend who had, had stolen something and then the judge got out of the bench and came and paid the fine for the guy. That kind of thing, where, where you take the punishment for the other. Our punishment laid on him, as Isaiah says. It's really important for us to know that when we speak of something like substitutionary atonement, we're talking about one strand of an idea that doesn't have the strength to carry all the luggage of God's identity to us. We end up, if we only hold on to this substitutionary idea, with a picture of a God who is vengeful like us, And so Paul uses the legal system of his day, uses the legal system that we set up, which is based mostly on sort of eye-for-eye kind of ideas where Jesus says, uh, rather turn your cheek. We build our legal system on eye-for-eye kind of ideas, and we start to think of God as punitive, as wanting to punish us, and then we mess up our idea of God completely when we think that Instead of punishing us, God punished his son. And you have to remove yourself a bit there because we were punishing the son on the cross. It was humans like us who were holding the whips and doing the mocking and and hammering the nails. We go all the way back to the time of Abraham and we remember how God provided a ram when Abraham was on his way to sacrifice Isaac. In Abraham's idea of the world, on Ur, where he came from, they sacrificed children because they thought that whatever gods they believed in would be happy with that kind of sacrifice. They thought that would make the gods pleased. And so Abraham's understanding of God, and you know how God whispers to us and and nudges us in the right direction. And 
Abraham hears that God is calling him to offer his son. Meanwhile, God is teaching Abraham that he does not want child sacrifice. It was when Abraham got up to the top of the mountain with Isaac that he learned that this was a different kind of God. And that's the first inkling of an idea of the notion that God is going to offer the sacrifice necessary for our redemption. So as Abraham is about to do what he has thought he should do for Isaac, there appears a ram caught in the bush. And in Genesis chapter 2, 22, verse 14, we read that Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So the substitutionary idea works in a way that helps us to understand in human terms what is happening on the cross. God is taking the injustice and the sin of this world into himself instead of letting it all fall on us. When we think about how God provided the ram for Abraham, we remember that God was telling us way back there, I will provide. I will provide. And maybe we can look back with longing to that simple time of Abraham when there was no temple, when there was no sacrificial system, when there was no set of scaffolding by which people could think that they could provide for themselves, that Abraham received the good news of God's gracious provision. And Paul tells us that by that faith, Abraham was saved. And that faith is a trust, a trust in the fact that God is good, that God will provide, that God forgives our sins. And part of that picture of that trust is the substitutionary atonement picture of Christ on the cross and Christ crucified that helps us to understand that he has taken the consequences of our sin upon himself. We like that metaphor for the crucifixion of Christ because, because it makes sense in terms of how we understand things. When you get cut off in the traffic, aren't you the kind of guy who wants to turn on the floodlights on your car and drive up behind the person in front of you? I've learned not to do that. But I want to, because I'm a revenge-based kind of person. I'm actually the worst. I'm the passive-aggressive guy. As soon as the little green arrow flashes and you hoot, then I can't find drive or first gear. I often stall because I get nervous because you're hooting behind me. That's how I work. I'm working on it. I'm trying to get better. But that substitutionary picture of what God is doing helps us to understand because we identify with it. But then there's another aspect to, to what Christ is doing on the cross, and that is a representative sacrifice or as a representative model of atonement. You read in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, that in him... All the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The New Testament goes to great pains to help us to understand the fullness of God in Christ. That this Christ on the cross is God himself. But it also goes through great pains to help us to understand that Jesus is fully human. If you look at the genealogy at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, you'll see that Matthew takes Jesus' ancestry all the way to Abraham. But if you go to Luke chapter 3, you find that in Luke chapter 3, verse 38, Luke reminds us that Jesus' ancestry goes all the way back to Adam. And so Jesus is a fully representative human being. And Paul speaks of Adam as the first Adam and Jesus as the second Adam. 
And remember that the first Adam made a terrible choice. Maybe he felt like he wanted to be alienated. As I sometimes think we sin or curse or get up to all sorts of mischief when we feel that God is a little bit too close and a little bit too challenging for us. And then we try to numb ourselves to God's presence in some way or the other or convince ourselves that we aren't good enough. It's something that that happens to each and every one of us. We all have a bit of Adam in us, don't we? We we feel like we don't know enough, like we aren't enough, so we, we hear that there is something else that will just give us everything that we need, a little fruit on the tree. don't know how that fruit comes to you. Maybe it's that new job that you really think you need, or the car, or the bicycle, or whatever it is, and, or the gadget. That's, that's another problem I have. You think that's going to solve all your problems? We all have that. We choose disobedience to God and we choose to take that fruit and we choose alienation from God. Just like Adam, the first representative human being. But Jesus, in his death on the cross, becomes the second Adam. And just like in the garden, Adam chose to take the fruit In the garden, Jesus says to God, not my will, but yours. Jesus chooses to take the cup. And in that moment, I hope that we recognize in Jesus' heroic decision to take the cup, to to be a representative human, a good human, a sinless human who chooses the way of obedience instead of disobedience, He chooses the way of belonging instead of alienation. That we learn that we have that little something in us that can also choose obedience to God. And in choosing obedience to God, even to the cross, he breaks the curse. He gets us over that hump. He gets us to the point of realizing that in his power and grace, we can be freed from sin. We need no longer be alienated from the kingdom of God. And we can receive, just as we receive from Adam that sinful nature, from Christ we can receive that Christ-like nature. Two strands. Substitutionary, it's not enough. It's not going to hold all the weight. Representative, it's a little harder to understand, but it holds more of the weight. And then I want to call the other one invitational. Jesus is the Word of God. The Word is an invitation. Look at this cross behind me. I hope it preaches louder than I do. A word. Our favorite verse, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. For God so loved. I, I have a lot of respect for atheists because of the courage of their convictions. But I often want to say to my atheist friends, I also don't believe in that God that you don't believe in. I believe in this God. I believe in this being the final and perfect picture of God who invites us into love. Jesus' arms stretched open on the cross a sign of welcome, a sign that you belong, a sign of invitation. This is another part of the way in which God reconciles us to himself by just reminding us 
the door is open. You can come in. You belong, or more like it says in Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Just open it and let me in. Through the cross, we are invited to turn our ideas of who we thought God was upside down. And it's a huge transformation from this idea of God who is far away up in heaven and a little bit angry with us and seeking to punish us to the idea of Jesus, fully God and fully human, humbling himself to death and saying to us, I will go as low as I need to go in order to lift you up. I will go as low as I need to go in order to lift you up. And so we are reminded in verse 22 of Colossians chapter 1, He has now reconciled in His fleshly body through death so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him. In a world where people tell you that you don't belong, Christ has said you belong. You're not an alien. You are reconciled. Christ has shown us that our sins can be forgiven. Holy, blameless, irreproachable. And Paul tells us all you need to do is continue. Established, securely established and steadfast in the faith. What is that faith? That faith is trust in the nature of God revealed to us in Jesus. At the time that this was written, people didn't have trouble believing that there was a God. They believed that just about everything was a God. When they spoke about faith, they said, believe in this nature of God, this loving nature of God revealed in the Word of God, which is Jesus. Without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard. So this faith gives us hope. And this gospel is Christ crucified and risen again. Which has been proclaimed. And I just love this little flourish. To every creature under heaven. We humans often think it's just for us. But every creature... Every single created being of God reconciled because of what Christ is doing this day on the cross. Let us pray. Lord, help us to weave together these understandings of how you took into yourself the punishment that we deserved. The consequence of our sin. The pain that we have caused to ourselves and others. By your wounds we are healed. Help us to hold this other strand in which you rep represent us. If we only had Adam, we would be condemned to death. If we only had the example of Adam, and if that was our final nature, we would always choose alienation. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, you chose obedience. And you showed us a better way. And help us to hold this representative idea, this invitational idea in which on the cross 
we see your love held up before us. Let your gaze pierce deeply into our hearts. Let our hearts know that they are loved, even though you see our darkest and most broken. Lord, our words and my words are not adequate to describe how you've reconciled us. And so, Lord, we offer you these thoughts as the beginning of our understanding of your amazing grace open to each and every one of us. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite us to stand and sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. seated as we lift up our prayers for the world around us and for ourselves. If the cross tells us anything, O Lord, it is that you know and share our suffering. You are with us and all those who are victims of disease, of the violence or abuse of others, of our own ignorance chronic pain, or foolishness, or sin. Help us and restore us, O Lord, we pray. You are with us, and all those who inflict pain on others in our world. To our selfishness or greed, through our brokenness or anger, through our rigidity or need to be right, help us and restore us, O Lord, we pray. You are with us, 
and all those who are fearful of threats to this world we call home, to our safety and survival, to our sense of community and togetherness as people. Help us and restore us, O Lord, we pray. Christ of the cross, see our need of your grace. Hear our prayer for your mercy and come to us again to help and restore because we cannot heal ourselves. Amen. As we come to the close of our service, I remind you that uh, the offerings that are taken on Good Friday go to help us educate ministers to proclaim the gospel of Christ. And so if you would like to give today, remember that that's what your offering will go to. And that goes to sponsor the training of our ministers and it's uh, hard work to run our own educational institutions to make sure that our ministers are prepared to proclaim the gospel and it costs the church a lot of money, but that is the point of taking the offering on Good Friday, that uh, Paul said that he preaches nothing but Christ and him crucified. And so that's what we want to train our preachers to preach too. So that's our offering for today. But if you didn't and bring money, and we prefer that you didn't, if you uh, are able to give via EFT, just make sure that you mark your offerings for today as Good Friday or uh, Education for Mission and Ministry, EMU, but maybe just Good Friday is going to be the easiest one, and that'll help us to allocate those funds to be collected into the pool of collections from the church to go to training of ministers. And so we come to the end and we say our final prayers, and today we don't say the benediction because our service only ends on Sunday, whether you're here in person or you're online, uh, the service sort of technically starts yesterday and continues to Sunday. And so please, um, there are just so many services uh, going online from various churches, etc. Our limited offering is Good Friday and Easter Sunday, but uh, feel free to tune into the languages that you understand on Facebook and YouTube and grow in your understanding of what God has done for us. So we come to our final prayers and then the music will continue to play and you can just, uh, in your own time, move out to go, to, the, uh, to, go, to go outside. Also a reminder that because of the COVID restrictions, you can't uh, stop and chat, especially in the foyer. Sorry that you have to move on and uh, move out as, as quickly as possible so that we don't have cross-contamination, etc. And uh, we pray for that to be over and it's actually so good last year we couldn't be together on good friday and easter sunday so today it's been a real privilege to be together and uh, take this message that you have heard with limited seating out to the world in which you live wait i missed one In your cross, O oh Christ, we see your incredible love. In your death, O oh Lord, we discover your irrepressible life. In your suffering, O oh Savior, we find that we are saved. Thank you for leading us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. Now lead us into the world as agents of love, light, and salvation. Amen.